This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Field, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Brandon Pone. On today's show, we talk about professional development throughout the healthcare provider's career. Here today to talk us through this topic is Dr. Larry Benz. Dr. Larry Benz is the president and CEO of Confluent Health, which includes the following companies, uh, some of which uh, a lot of you may have heard, Evidence in Motion, Texas Physical Therapy Specialist, Pro Rehab Louisville, Fit for Work, Breakthrough Physical Therapy, PT Central, the International Spine Institute, and the Neuro Recovery Training Institute. He's nationally recognized for his expertise in private practice, physical therapy, and occupational medicine. Dr. Benz's current interests include conducting research and integrating empathy, compassion, and positive psychology interventions within physical therapy. With over 150 invited presentations to PT programs, national conferences, and MBA programs throughout the country, Dr. Benz has been on APTA's advisory panel on practice and board of physical therapy specialties and is currently a trustee with the Foundation for Physical Therapy, Physical Therapist Business Alliance, and University of Louisville. He's a recipient of numerous businesses and physical therapy awards, including the Kentucky Physical Therapy's Outstanding Physical Therapist Award and Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year for his region. He's the co-developer of physicaltherapist.com and blog.evidenceinmotion.com, a blog devoted to the principles of evidence-based practice in physical therapy. His foundation is the co-developer of Jackmel Rehabilitation in Haiti, which can be found at pthelpforhaiti.org. Larry, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We, I realize we kept your bio pretty brief, but is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about you that we didn't mention in the intro? No, not not at all. Uh, and, and by the way, all those initials after my last name, is any is anybody with any humility will tell you all they mean is insecurity, insecurity, insecurity. <laughs> we kind of talked, Larry, in the pre-show here about how you've always seemed to have been interviewed regarding kind of your business and entrepreneurial side. And, you know, and today we're actually going to take a different turn on that. And, you know, and Larry, would you mind telling our audience a little bit about your academic journey and how it led to where you're at today. Yeah, so I, I appreciate it because I'm sort of a fan and a connoisseur, if you will, of higher education. It's just one of my passionate interests. Um, we all in physical therapy like to identify ourselves as, as learners and ongoing uh, you know, uh, lifelong development. But I've really taken that to heart. So I've served in capacities where I've been a chair of the board of trustees of a major public university. Um, I've got an undergraduate degree from Bowling Green State University. I did a master's in physical therapy at the U.S. Army Baylor program. I was in the Army for five years, enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, along the way, I received an a entry-level doctorate, or I'm sorry, post-professional DBT from MGH, um, uh, Institute of Health Promotions. I was able to uh, get my MBA through Ohio State University. Uh, and then I completed you know, an additional master's in uh, uh, positive psychology at University of Pennsylvania. So I've had this sort of journey with, you know, three masters, a doctorate, an undergraduate degree. And, you know, part of that was just not only a desire to learn, but I also really enjoy attending different universities and getting a perspective. Um, Higher education is a fascinating industry and profession in and of itself under immense pressure right now, um, in part because, you know, the baby boomers have now peaked. And so you have to see these as businesses and they really need to uh, you know, engage enrollment management, and revenue enhancing at times. You know, if you look at physical therapy as a profession, it wasn't any uh, particular you know, APTA or otherwise that drove us into an entry level uh, doctorate degree. You know, a clinical doctorate degree. It was higher education. It was in part, in large part, to extract additional revenue and tuition dollars out of it. Um, the profession drove us to an entry level master's degree. So this sort of academic journey I've been on has all been, you know, primarily 
driven by being a fan of higher ed and wanting to you know learn additional things that I always felt would help as a PT. So my journey, for example, in uh, a master's in positive psychology was I felt that there was a lot of research in the social sciences that translated into physical therapy, but it was a body of knowledge that we hadn't quite had any exposure to at PT school. Uh, my interest in MBA was purely driven by the fact that at that time I was already considered by most people a pretty successful businessman and entrepreneur. But I wanted to learn what I did right, what I learned I did wrong. What I what, what did I learn that I wouldn't do again or that I wouldn't have done had I gone through a traditional MBA program? And then certainly, you know, entry-level uh, or post-professional TDPT, <laughs> whatever we call it now, was simply to show my commitment to the profession and, and where we were going in terms of, uh, you know, doctoring uh, science. So um, that's been my journey. And I think if you look at uh, how we look at our company, uh, in our companies, we've got 120 locations, uh, plus evidence in motion, plus a company called Fit for Work. And we approach all of our businesses as talent management business you know, first, because uh, whether you're in physical therapy or you're at Zappo selling shoes, we believe if we can develop talent, then we can uh, you know, survive during any, any type of uh, vulnerable time period or any type of pressure from the external environment. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of color, a little bit of insights to uh, some of the some of the whys behind uh, my constant uh, take to be an adult uh, student. <laughs> yeah, that's a great take on that, Larry. I think uh, you know being able to roll with the punches nowadays is going to be uh, very helpful, especially for healthcare being such a question mark moving forward. You know, we recently had Jeff Moore on the show, and he talked a little bit about the topic of professional development for healthcare students transitioning into new graduate clinicians. Um, but professional development is something that we really find important throughout one's career. Um, could you maybe give our audience your definition of professional development and what it means to you? Yeah. So, you know, I was list- recently participated in a, um, a, a seminar that was done by some folks from the Harvard Business School. One of the things they pointed out is that really in any profession, you have to look at about 200 hours a year in development. So if you take, you know, your average, you know, work as being 2,080 hours in a year, you're spending about 10% of your time in development. And why is that? Well, what we know is that information doubles every 13 months. And so if you look at a graph, a simple graph with, you know, time on one axis and knowledge on another, we know the body of knowledge is exponential. And as a point in is a point of time, what your personal knowledge is every day to a certain extent, relative to the amount of information knowledge that's out there, we get a little bit of dumb, dumber every day, <laughs> you know, when taken in that perspective. So what you have to do is have to have a commitment to not only your own personal, you know, development uh, in, in, within your profession and otherwise, but also what are some enablers that will allow you to keep up with this doubling of information every 13 months. And that can only happen through collaboration, through adult learning, asynchronous, synchronous uh, ability. Uh, discussion boards, uh, debate, uh, intellectual uh, defense of your positions, uh, journals, and all the different tools and resources that are out there. So we look at our company as a talent management company, like I said. So when we bring in physical therapists, we genuinely believe that the 200 and approximately 50 PT programs do an excellent job with, with developing them as professionals. They learn the science. But the research will also indicate what tends to happen in PT school is you have sort of this de-evolution of your own personal empathy and compassion. And so we have to remind and go back to our uh, new PTs and remind them why they came in the profession to begin with. And so we ask them to, you know, look at those initial letters that they sent to the PT schools telling them why they want to become a PT. Then we work on tacit knowledge skills and tacit knowledge skills by nature are things you really don't learn all that much in PT school. So they're, you know, collaboration and all the, what we would call the soft skills. So our professional development initially with PTs is that we essentially mandate that they go through a certification or residency or a fellowship. There's really not an option not to do that in our companies. And the reason we do that is because we feel like that's the great level setter, the great equalizer, no matter what PT program you went to. And it also assures that they onboard with us in a program that allows them to learn compassion, empathy, high quality connections, reflective listening, mindfulness, those skills that traditionally have not been emphasized within PT school, coupled with a relative uh, consistency in their critical thinking skills and their hands-on skills that we believe will enable them to become an expert or a master clinician, you know, which ultimately culminates in board certification uh, initially, in some case they become fellows. 
So that is our sort of talent management process. They go within that. Now, along that way, and by the way, that's an 18-month to two-year process. And during that time, we're culling them, evaluating them, and saying, do they have an acumen or an aptitude for leadership and management? If so, great. If not, that's okay, too. We're going to then push them more into the fellowship and even advanced clinical training, mentoring, being clinical supervisors, and really becoming you know, possessed, if you will, or passionate about the, the, the clinical sciences. If they have an aptitude for leadership and management, we're going to then supply them with additional resources uh, through our talent management process that allows them to go through leadership and management training, ultimately resulting in a year-long program called the Executive Program of Private Practice Management. Now, all that's a mouthful to say that we really believe, generally speaking, your professional pathway starts and it really never ends. It's formalized, at least in our culture and our company, but the informal structures, the, the, the mentoring and, and certainly the intern, the, the, the groups that they're in, they're in these sort of high quality groups that you know, are team coaching and leadership coaching. And that, that just goes on. That's just part of what you have to maintain. So what I like about the term professional development is that that's, in fact, what we're doing. We're continuing to develop professionals. What I don't like about it is there's this insinuation that there's a sort of resting time or this, this ongoing period of time where you just sort of stop. And what we see is a problem in most professionals when they hit this sort of five and 10 year point, they no longer have five and 10 years of experience. They have about three years of experience that they then repeat every year. And that's a problem. So development, when you hear CEOs of large Fortune 500 companies and technology companies saying that your employees need to spend 200 hours a year in development, we take that we take that rather seriously. And then, as you all well know, um, through deliberate practice and other means, there's so-called 10,000 hours to master your craft, whether that be 8,000 or 12,000. You know, it's about five years as a PT. So we really we really take to heart uh, that. You could only enhance and improve in development through deliberate practice, feedback, improvement, and 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 making you know making it very difficult to to, to uh, continue to evolve. So it's a it's a cultural element, and my encouragement is that you know all PTs end up in an environment that has a culture that drives them to achieve and develop in sort of an ongoing upward spiral way. Absolutely, Larry. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the big advice that I've heard a lot when I first started out was don't chase money, chase excellence. And I think that's definitely held true, at least for me. And I couldn't agree with that more. And and I know, Larry, you kind of mentioned some of the solutions to my next question here. Um, but what are some of the best strategies that you would give to clinicians 5, 10, or even 20 years out of practice who are constantly trying to continue their professional development? Yeah. So, you know, it's so much easier today than it's ever been. You just, you know, line up a Coursera or a Udemy amongst others, even Stanford and, and Harvard, some of these have their own now. But the reason why Coursera and Udemy and those things thrive is because the rock star professors are encouraged to post their courses, which promotes them, promotes the university, promotes their books, <laughs> and allows, you know, folks like us to be able to access a course that has, you know, Martin Seligman and Angela Duckworth from the University of Pennsylvania teaching positive psychology that allows us to access a Richard Boyata's course at Case Western Reserve University on social and emotional intelligence, you know, that allows us to take a course in, you know, advanced economics by a professor at Chicago University. So we are just very fortunate that so many of those resources available, they're minimal cost or no cost at all. On top of that, now you have podcasts. Well, certainly you've got your entertaining podcasts, and, and I certainly enjoy mine just like the next person does, but it gives you tremendous opportunity from a content perspective to access things you, you never thought were possible. Um, then I think sort of the third mechanism is your, your general you know, understudy under either a mentor or you're mentoring somebody. And what that entails is this whole concept, um, it's Andres Erickson concept of delivered practice, which is practice that is incredibly hard and difficult. What skills are you trying to achieve that you can only get to incrementally through direct feedback? through ongoing breaking through barriers of tough practice. So that is what I would call your sort of, you know, ongoing clinical mentoring. Then on top of that, you've got a whole battery of, you know, the social sciences that are out there that are readily acceptable. Uh, it's a great book by Travis Bradbury named, uh, you know, it's just called uh, Social and Emotional Intelligence. And it allows for self-assessment and then, you know, its own course in a very thin book, a very readable book. Um, so we really believe that the resources are, are not lacking. And in fact, 
the difficulty is just the opposite. It's finding, it's narrowing your choices. So um, my advice to students and to others is find the mediums that work well for you. So for me personally, I'm a reader, so I like reading, but I will listen to a book, but I very seldom will listen to a book completely. I'll, I'll use you know sort of the Kindle WhisperNet and I'll go between reading and listening to it. So I'm also somebody who likes the start and the stop and the discipline of a course. So if I take a Coursera course, I finish it, you get a little free certificate because you really haven't paid anything for it. And you put that and you post it on your LinkedIn page. For our therapist, we have you know, our talent management process, we have a, a course called PTville 1, PTville 2. When you onboard, you take a course in Call to Care, which is the positive psychology course. You take a course in you know, customer service. A uh, third course that we've recently integrated is Words at Harm, Words at Heal, which is Adrian Lowe course, um, you know, through his International Spine and Pain Institute. And then a fourth one is a level setting course we have in the pain sciences, a, a TNE course. And, and so we sort of believe that we have to have a modular approach uh, for a while. But as they become more adult learners, it's more of a reciprocal process than they become the mentor and the teacher. Um, but they can only only keep up if they, in turn, continue to take you know additional development themselves. Because you fundamentally have to have to have a position that in order to really know something, you have to be able to teach it. And what we say in our culture is you don't really know something until you could teach it and expl- and be able to explain it to an 89-year-old great-great-grandmother and a 8-year-old great-great-great-grandson. So that's the approach that, w- that, that we take on it. And, and um, you know, these, are, these aren't anything unique to us, I don't think. It's just, it's just we really fundamentally believe that at the end of the day, you've got to continue to, pr- as a company, you've got to continue to emphasize and provide the resources that allow people to, to thrive and flourish in areas where they're, where they're very passionate about. Absolutely, Larry. I totally couldn't agree with you more on that. I think for me even too, you know, Jeff Moore even said a while back when we interviewed him, about how being able to kind of choose since there's such an abundance of knowledge out there and really self-assessing and seeing where are you weak at or where do you need to grow at? And, you know, once you know, find out what your weakness is, solving it is easy. But I think even so, you know, with kind of that transition kind of more to teaching in that, Larry, you know, let's say that a clinician wants to focus on developing their teaching skills. Now, this could be someone who eventually wants to become a more formal educator at some point, whether it be through CEU instruction um, clinical instruction, academia, I mean, to, what, sure. to, to each their own. What are your recommendations for educational development that you would recommend to these individuals apart from what you kind of just mentioned? Yeah, so, I mean, um, great question. I firmly believe in process and, and the formalization of uh, training. So the end point, the initial end point is board certification. Or milestone, I should call it an endpoint. <laughs> but the initial milestone is board certification. The quickest route to board certification is residency, because residencies approved, you know, sort of APTA accredited residencies, are allowed to sit for their, you know, uh, specialization right away. Um, so that could be done in as little as eighteen months to two years. If that's too intense, for lack of a better word, the pathway to get there can be done through certification courses or enough CE management courses that qualify for you to be able to take your board certification after the you know, requisite number of hours. So that's the first milestone. If beyond that, they have a penchant and aptitude and a desire, uh, a real passion to teach, we really believe that the best clinical integration of academia and practice is a fellowship. So there are lots of fellowship opportunities. You no longer have to pack your bags and move to California. Blended education has been enabled for fellowship programs. There are a number of them. Uh, We strongly suggest one that is obviously accredited. So that way at the end, they they become a um, a AOMS fellow. So we have just found that the fellowship has really attracted those folks that want to teach, but don't necessarily want to go back to a, you know, higher education environment where their full-time vocation is teaching. For those folks, they can do a fellowship, maybe get a DSC somewhere, or just go on and work on a PhD. One of the the bottlenecks or the constraints in our industry is that there are not enough faculty at our 250 roughly PT programs. So, and they require a certain percentage of their instructors to have a terminal degree, either being a PhD or DSC. So one of the things we've identified at Evidence in Motion is that 
we believe that the education within a fellowship program, and I'm not necessarily talking about our fellowship program. There's plenty of just very, very reputable fellowship programs out there. Coupled with some additional work should enable somebody to receive a DFC. So we're working aggressively and um, we'll hope to be able to formalize an announcement very soon where our fellows will be able to complete some additional academic work and, and, and obtain a DSC. Then you've got two options at that point. You can then flip over into a you know higher ed PT program where your full-time vocation primarily is teaching um, and acad- academic research, or you can stay within a clinical realm full-time with a significant portion of your time being a clinical instructor and being a clinical mentor. Um, so that's that's where we see the best pathway for those who are really, you know, have a high desire to teach, but maybe maybe do academic research, but maybe not. Yeah, Larry, that is really exciting for uh, for up and comers. I think that are interested in fellowship. That sounds like a really cool opportunity with the DSC. I uh, kind of wish you guys had uh, come up with this a couple years ago before I started the EDD, but. Uh... <laughs> Right, right. And EDT is a good option, too. It's just not, a, again, it's not a, as much of a pervasive op- option for a, it's not a traditional track for PTs. Right. Sure, sure. Um, Larry, what would you say are some of the barriers that clinicians need to be on the lookout for that could hinder their professional development at any point during their career? The biggest barrier in my mind for a clinician is what you would call in the psychological circles habituation or attenuation. And that is that you become so used to doing what you're doing that you absolutely forget that you have now miraculously enabled a patient to recover and in some cases walk again, lift again, go back to their activities and their life. And so we have to be on guard for that constantly. Coupled closely with that is the natural evolution to over repeated time to dehumanize, which then can can lead to burnout. So burnout is more of a psychological, think of it as like depression, okay? Dehumanizing is natural. If I see 20, if you see 20 patients tomorrow, at some point you're going to dehumanize, which basically means you take a three-dimensional person, you make them two dimensions. That's a natural phenomenon. It is unavoidable, but it, you can recognize it. You can recognize triggers for it. And, and the antidote for it is very simple. It's basically taking a break. It's basically, uh, you know, knocking yourself silly, taking a walk, meditating, you know, getting out of the clinical care that allows you to hit this pause button and reset to say, no, and I'm going back and remembering that I'm a unique human. They're a unique human. We have to share, you know, an emotional connection. And and, 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 we, and I really need to be, uh, remember to be compassionate, and empathetic, and all the, you know, sort of the psychosocial things I need to uh, enable. On, in this patient experience. So if that doesn't happen over time, you can get to burnout, which is a complete loss of zest, enthusiasm, where you feel that you're no longer making a contribution and you no longer matter in the profession that you're worth. We know, for example, that as much as 30% of physicians uh, go to burnout, which again is, a, is, is essentially a diagnosis. What we're concerned with, what I'm concerned with is that as PTs, we might be falling into that same trap because our external influences and our and our key motivators go from really a desire to help people to, oh, I gotta get my notes done on time, I gotta produce a certain number of units, I gotta fill in this thing, I gotta spend all this time on my EMR, I've got to get this pre-certed. And I've got all these externalities that ironically at the end of the day. Um, take away from the very thing that a PT tends to love about what they do. So combination of attenuation, habituation, which can tend to lead, lead to uh, dehumanization and burnout. Absolutely, Larry. I think those are some good points there. And, you know, to kind of ask one off the script here, because I've been kind of thinking about this, you know, what would you recommend? So say I'm a clinician in a clinic, and I feel like I'm doing okay in that regard, and I'm not really going towards the burnout role. But I noticed others are in my same clinic. And sure. not that I'm trying to say that any that I'm working at right now, I'm just trying to put it in context. I'm sure it exists in some places. What would you recommend is the best way to kind of help the others kind of see the light or them in best way that you can help them get out of that burned out state? Great question. And it has been probably one of the key learning points that we've tried to organizationally um, build strategies around the last two years. And the simple answer is you have to learn to cultivate purpose. So PTs are drawn to become physical therapists because they don't look at it as a job. They do not look at it as a, as a, a, prof- as a um, career. They look at it as meaningful, purposeful work. They want to impact and make a difference in people's lives. I've yet to meet a PT who got into our profession that really didn't want to do that. 
Um, as opposed to, again, Amy Wisniewski at, at, at Yale has identified this. Is it a job? Is it a career? Or is it meaningful, purposeful work? Well, fortunately, and, and, and thank God for this, we all are blessed to be able to work in a profession where we are guided and aspire to do purposeful, meaningful work. Um, so what happens along the way is that we forget what we're doing is meaningful, purposeful work. And so you have to do what is known as cultivated or you have to encourage it, or you have to remind folks of it. So what are some techniques to do so? One of the techniques we do in our company is a technique called Remind, which is R-E colon M-I-N-D, which is simply highlighting monthly something that jolts people and hits the pause button and have, asks them to reflect and, and cite patient examples. Read the thank you notes patients have. Look at the pictures. Have patient reunion days. You know, look at all of the items that you've had over this past week, and you haven't just been a PT. You and everybody in your organization sort of rallied around this whole idea of meaningful, purposeful work. And what you find, uh, the research suggests that purpose trumps passion every time. So they'll take five star employees and find out what drives them. Is it purpose or is it passion? Well, you hope it's both, right? You hope people have an enthusiasm, which is the passion, versus um, the whole idea of, of making a difference, being part of something larger and impacting people's lives, which is purpose or meaningful work. But the reality is you can't have both. But if you can only have one of the two, the research suggests that you'd only want purpose because purpose trumps passion. There are more five-star employees as deemed by employee ratings, as deemed by longevity on the job, um, you know, as deemed by feedback from, from, from customers, from patients. Uh, if, if somebody who's primarily motivated intrinsically through purposeful, meaningful work. So I think, I think all of these techniques to cultivate purpose, it's, it's a renewable resource. You can't just stop and say, okay, now I've reset. I now have purpose again. You have to go back and you, and, and, and has to, it's kind of like uh, motivation. You have to, to continually remind folks and cultivate it. It's not a one-time, one-time occasion. So I think that's, what's missing generally in our profession. We train people well. They become PTs. They're doing all this amazing work, but somehow or another, we stop highlighting that amazing work. And what happens is then there becomes this disconnect between the purpose and the award. And the award shifts from making a difference and impacting people's lives to maybe it's compensation, maybe it's a bonus, maybe it's getting your notes done on time. And so what all we're trying to do as an organization, we're trying to encourage other organizations is just reconnect a therapist to the very purpose of why they got into the profession. I think that's a great take, Larry. And thank you for that. I'm sure that'll definitely help some of our listeners. And kind of going back to the topic here, I know you mentioned some of this before in the interview here, but are there any specific CEU courses or business type courses, books, or other resources or podcasts that you would that you feel would be good for those looking to develop their career professionally in the physical therapy realm that perhaps weren't mentioned? I think what makes a PT distinctly uh, different than other professions is that we spend time with patients, we put our hands on patients, and we explain things with patients, not only about their conditions, but ways to prevent it. So those three things, I think, are something we do very, very different. What we tend to rely on, though, is the science. We tend to rely on the evidence, which is good. We all need evidence-based practice. We all need science. What we forget about of those uniquenesses that will keep us uniquely human is in this new smart age where machine learning and artificial intelligence, the difference we have as PTs is, you know, we could have resources with machine age learning and artificial intelligence, but what makes us distinct is our ability to connect with patients, to share emotion with them, to have high quality connections and reflective listening. So I think what makes PTs better, in addition to all the traditional professional development things that I've talked about, social and emotional intelligence, um, empathy, compassion, all those kind of things. I think what makes us distinctly human is, is the fact that we're humans. So how do we become better PTs? We become better PTs by actually, you know, being a subscriber to the arts in literature, in movies, and whether it's Netflix or Reader's Digest. Years ago, I used to tell our PTs, this shows you how long I've been in this business for, you know, since 1986. I, I would almost mandate to our PTs, one of the things you want to become a better PT, read Reader's Digest, because that's what your patients are reading. You know, do things that your patients are doing that allow you to 
more deeply connect with your patients. So I don't want to ignore the uniquely human side of all this that, that allows us to share humanity with, with our patients. Now, flipping over to some specific resources, we really feel pretty strongly that there are a lot of extremely good blended education courses, which the research suggests is a much better way to train PTs. And that is that you have sort of asynchronous learning, synchronous learning, discussion boards, feedback, collaboration, but then you have intensive hands-on courses where you're working in teams and you're working on clinical skills, either under a direct mentor, you know, sort of a golf lesson. You're either under one, you know, one golf pro or you've got three, three students to one golf pro. So I, you know, there are tons of uh, a solid research or, or solid courses that are out there. Just great work being done. Um, I tend to recommend to folks, um, you know, I own an education course, so I don't want to sound self-promotion, but what I, what I do tend to, to recommend to people is go to courses where the people who've published research are teaching, where the people who are the master clinicians with a lot of initials at their last name, but are still in the clinic when they're doing. One of the things I tell people to avoid is avoid talking heads. If they're folks who did it at one time and are no longer doing it, and the only way they make a living is by telling people how to do it, that's probably a course to avoid. So it's a little bit easier for me to make recommendations on what to avoid than it is to what to take. But again, solid resources that are open access, you know, uh, MOOC courses, if you will, massive online courses. The professional meetings, you know, I just came back from PPS meeting. There's a lot of good, you know, presentations there. You know, heck, I think you can get, you know, eight to 12 continuing education contact hours a day if you really took advantage of everything. But it is the kind of, you know, thing where you have to have the formal training. I also like podcasts quite a bit. I'm glad to see, you know, folks like yourself having dedicated podcasts, in this case, towards the educational resources on PTs. But there's a ton of them on, on, on pain and musculoskeletal uh, as well. And then, and, then, and then, of course, you have the, you know, traditional online stuff. So lots of good opportunities and, and uh, plenty, plenty of avenues for people to take. Yeah, I love that, Larry. It really seems like, you know, the world is your oyster if you're looking for a professional development right now. So that's that's a good problem to have. Larry, what would you say are some of the benefits to having an employee who has developed their career professionally? Um, and what are some characteristics that an interviewer or clinic owner may be looking for in regards to professionalism? So that's kind of a two-part question. You know, uh, what's really interesting now is Interviews and resumes are the two most traditional ways that we assess, you know, prospective employees. The evidence suggests that those are the two most unreliable mechanisms are interviews and uh, CVs. So what are some ways to mitigate um, those? One of them is shadowing, job shadowing, actually having the person come in and, and, and work with the PT either a couple hours and, and, and job shadow them. Second is, is, while interviews generally are unreliable, structured interviews are not, where you've already identified questions you're going to ask and that you already have determined answers that you're looking for. Uh, personality inventories and all the psychometrics that go with that are also pretty strong. So what I look for is a compelling story in an applicant. Tell me where you're at now and how you got there. And what did you learn along the way that got you there? What courses did you take? What mentors did you have? How did you get to where you're at educationally? So I look at sort of this living resume. Um, these are the dynamics of the courses, the instructors, the mentors that I've had that got me where I'm at, you know, right now. So that's what I'm really looking for in that in that applicant is the story and the desire and the aptitude, you know, to, to learn and, and grow. Now, the second part of what I think you asked is really, um, you know, in regards to uh, a clinic owner, may looking for, you know, in regards to professionalism, I think the schools, generally speaking, do a pretty good job on the professional components. I, we never run into, you know, PTs that have ethics problems or things like that. What's fascinating, though, is the reasons, uh, and the reason I say that students are so much better now than they used to be, which probably counter to most of the old fogies that you have, like me on the show. But, um, you know, I think, I think they're way better, and I'll tell you why. The average new PT stays at their first job less than a year. Okay, that's a statistic that, that that's really should bother everybody in the profession. But the reason they leave their employer is vastly different than it was five and 10 years ago. Five and 10 years ago, they would leave an employer because they had a better opportunity, somebody that paid more or something they perceived as, as being different. Now they're leaving employers early in their career because they're not getting the professional development they thought was promised to them because that employer may not be following documentation and requirements you know, from the standpoint of professionalism that they've been taught and that they've been, you know, sort of the wisdom that's been imparted in them. And so, you know, 
we don't see a lack of commitment to professionalism by new entrant PTs. I don't see it. I don't think our, our, our CEOs and our company see it either. Um, so that's not a, a something. So what we really try to have to do is come to some mutual agreement on a career development path for them. That's why we make them commit to our commitments. We make them commit to you know an educational path that will enable them to become a board certified specialist. So it's sort of a self-fulfilling you know prophecy that we have in that we commit. It's 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 kind of what's known as a ketuba, which which basically means it's a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> and the prenuptial agreement says, "I'm going to commit to these educational resources to you and this opportunity for you to become a board certified pathway." Because if you leave our organization, we're going to do everything we can to keep you in our organization. But if you leave, you're going to come out of here a whole lot better than you came in. And, and, and we think we love the millennial generation because they love meaningful, purposeful work. They love the cultural side of that. And they love to grow, learn, develop. And they love feedback. So um, we're just not seeing any, any lack of professionalism from, from new entrant PTs, at least on that. No, that's a great take, Larry. And, you know, thank you so much for all that you've said throughout this interview today. As you know, I've learned a ton from this and I'm sure a lot of others has, have as well. And we normally like to finish each episode with this final question to each of our guests. And the question is, if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether that be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? You know, it's such a great question. And in a limited time, I would answer it this way. The goal, selfishly, is that I want the brightest and best to become PTs. And my fear is that the brightest and best aren't becoming PTs because our cost of our education system is too high. They come out into jobs that have not, their salaries have not kept up lockstep with the cost of that education. So in order to get the best and brightest to become PTs, we need to convince higher education to stop look at the, looking at their students as customers that they can extract higher tuition from, but as what is, will enable a better more efficient, more cost-effective way to educate and train. And in our case, we're talking DPTs. I think that's through elimination of a three-year DPT program. As you well know, we've been in instrumental in setting up programs where they're, they're working with higher ed institutes to, to change that curriculum from three to two years. Other schools are also uh, looking at two-and-a-half-year curriculum. So I, we're seeing some changes in a positive direction that way. I would then hope that, that, that employers can embrace you know, those kind of programs and then further through residency and otherwise continue their training into it. So that's what I would change. I would, I would, I would, you know, hit the hit the reset button on the thoughts that got us to a three-year DPT. We could train PTs effectively and cost effectively in two years, and then attract our best and brightest from careers in big data, sciences, and technology to becoming PTs again. <laughs> yeah, I love that, Larry. That's a great take on it. Um, you know, it, it, tonight was a great episode and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with us. Um, could you tell our audience a little bit about where they can find you online and on social media if they have questions or would just like to reach out and contact you? Yeah, sure. I'm real, real easy. I'm not afraid to give my email. I'm Larry at physicaltherapist.com. Uh, physicaltherapist.com is uh, something I reserved in the early, early internet days. Kind of a great story behind it. I'm at physical therapy on Twitter at physical therapy. Again, another interesting story how I got that uh, handle. And then on Instagram, I'm at physical therapist. I'm not a huge uh, Instagram guy. Uh, but then certainly, you know, one of those ways you can always reach out to me. I'm, I'm, I'm typically very, very responsive and, and uh, try to be as helpful as I can. Awesome, Larry. We've definitely been helpful this evening with everything as those have been some great quality answers that I think are definitely going to help a lot of people in the profession. So thank you so much for coming on, man. And always a pleasure to have you on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, really enjoy what you guys are doing and, and uh, would encourage you to continue to do so. Really love the fact that uh, as young PTs, you guys have taken this uh, you know monumental task on and it's, uh, it's, it's going to reap uh, a lot of benefits for all. Thanks. Just part of our goal to help contribute in whatever way we can. <laughs> Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, 
Extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.